This is Twit. Alrighty, folks, we are back from the break, and now it is time for that second interview I promised you, this time about Amazon's plans for its virtual assistant. Joining us to talk about it is The Washington Post's Caroline O'Donovan. Welcome back to the show, Caroline. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I am uh, very excited because we have heard rumor upon rumor upon rumor about um, Amazon's plans to kind of revamp, as I call it, A-L-E-X-A, so that it doesn't get triggered by, but you can say Amazon's virtual assistant, whatever you want to say. Uh, But uh, we've heard about Amazon's plans to revamp the virtual assistant for some time, and it would appear that you've gotten some actual interesting details about it. So tell us, what are the key features of the new AI-powered virtual assistant that make it different from kind of its classical counterpart? And Mm. how can people expect that it would change their experience using these Echo devices? Mm -hmm. Um, Is the A-L-E-X-A in the room with us right now? (laughs) (laughs) You are okay to say it. We we just kind of bleep it out afterward. We kind of no problem. Um, I do also, I love that people are calling the original or vanilla A-L-E-X-A um, uh, classic, uh, which gives it a kind of like a retro preppy um, vibe right. to me. Um, <laughs> anyway, I think that in terms of the new version, which last we've heard is now supposed to be coming out in mid-October, which is a bit of a delay from like late sub- late summer, September, which was the original goal, which is fully a year and now more than a year after they uh, had announced the product was coming. Um, I think the fir- one of the first things people are going to notice is that you have to pay for it if you want to use it. So uh, that's going to be a big change. Classic will still be free to people who own a device, but um, this is going to be a new paid paid product. Uh, they're still talking about exactly how much that's going to cost or what the model of the subscription is going to be. Um, I think the the most notable change will be sort of one of um, vibes <laughs> in that <laughs> this the new right is going to kind of remember who you are. She's going to talk to you like a person. She's going to ask you questions about yourself and try to remember them and use the answers um, to inform future conversations. So they're using words like conversational, but also words like likable and charisma, um, which are different from how a voice assistant like a operates today, right? Classic is way more call and response. It's not scripted, but um, you're sort of having to use specific words and phrases to activate it. Um, and it's responding with sort of pre-planned responses based on what you're asking. And the the new technology is going to sort of totally, uh, allegedly change um, how you interact with the device and what it feels like to, to own one and to talk to it. Um, and then inside of that, there are specific features that we get into in the piece a little bit um, mm-hmm. that uh, that people have been working on. So that could be anything from an AI summarized news briefing every day um, to uh, a feature that helps you find recipes. Um, so if you go back to what I was saying before about it being a little bit more personable, um, the documents that I obtained sort of suggest that um, you'll have a, a set up conversation with your ALEXA uh, the new version, they haven't come up with a, or they haven't decided on an official name for it yet. Um, uh, and maybe you'll, it will ask, you know, who's in your family and do they have dietary restrictions? And then the device will remember that information. And then later on when you're saying, oh, I don't know what to make for dinner tonight. Can you help me? It will theoretically remember that information and help guide you towards recipes um, that suit your family. Yeah. Uh, so then let's, I actually am kind of curious when it came to learning about these new skills or these this this potential uh, for when it would launch and what would be included. Um, is this a, is this just a simple sources familiar with the matter situation? Um, what 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 did you what did you comfortably share in the piece about how uh, the Washington Post discovered uh, a little bit more about the plans mm-hmm. for its virtual assistant? Yeah. I mean, we didn't share too much, but um, it is it's the report is based on documents, um, documents that describe planning documents that describe, you know, what goes into the launch of a product. So obviously, as it, the launch gets closer, you know, more information needs to be shared amongst all the different parts of a company um, when you're preparing to release something new into the world, which it seems like they are finally maybe ready to do. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So let's talk about then releasing this into the world. Um, how 
is this going to be positioned in terms of like, do we know is Amazon going to say, you know, what, what, let's say you get a new Echo device and by default you, upon, uh, you know, powering it up, you get the AI version. And then a month after that, you get to choose, okay, I'm, I'm done with the free trial. I got to switch back to classic or I have to continue to pay for this. I know that there's uh, talk of a subscription model. Do we know how much that might potentially cost? Um, has Amazon, have you discovered anything about Amazon's plans for how it will kind of push this forward and introduce it? Um, I, I would say that, uh, you know, based on my reporting, it looks like people inside Amazon this week are still debating um, a few specific things. One is what the public facing name will be. It has been referred to as Remarkable Alexa. And inside the company, it's called um, Project Banyan. Um, but the actual, you know, go to market name, I don't think has been fully decided yet or hadn't been um, when the article came out. The price and how the subscription is going to be um, structured. So whether it would be monthly or annual or, you know, quarterly, something like that. Um, those kind, those final details are still being uh, ironed out. Got it. Got it. Now, um, when it comes to this, you mentioned that uh, Amazon has kind of been slower than other competitors in launching uh, these AI products, these AI projects even. Uh, we've seen companies like Microsoft really step out there with, uh, especially with its partnership with OpenAI. Uh, Apple now has joined the fray. Uh, we have seen Google, of course, really stepping forward and people are looking to Amazon going, and where are you in this whole thing? So what do you think kind of, led to this timeline the, the fact that it seems to have been that seems to have taken longer for the company and um, does it does it is it going to be able to compete in a world where the other companies already have their AI products on the market for sure I think this has been a really big question of the last year for everyone and, and a little bit of a frustration point for Amazon I, I think the answer to can Amazon compete is um, pretty obvious, right? That's sort of their middle name. That's what they love to do. So um, I think they're definitely still in the mix here. I think that there's a couple different um, reasons why that happened. Um, Amazon's, you know, uh, pre pre existing pre chat pre chat GPT pre generator gen generative AI boom, um, consumer facing assistant product was built on a completely different technology, right? Like what I was talking about before, something that's a little bit more, um, if not scripted, a little bit more structured. It's not conversational. It's not um, creating responses from scratch. It's not intelligent, right? When it's responding to you and completely, it's not just um, a simple upgrades, like switch of a button to upgrade the system that Alexa was built on to the thing that they're building now, right? So it's a little bit more complicated than you might imagine to just turn Alexa, which feels like something that you're talking to, um, into a chat GPT type technology, right? Which it also feels like you're talk just talking to. Um, your on your end, it's similar, but on the, the other end, it's um, it's it's a it's almost like a you know non comparable technology. So it really is it's a total revamp of what lies beneath the surface there. Um, there's also the head of of Amazon's devices division left within the last year. The division had layoffs. So I think there's been a lot of changes within the devices division itself um, that have impacted, you know, how much work they're able to do over there. Um, that's the division that makes Alexa. And then I think another big problem for them is that the AI experts at Amazon, for the most part, um, sit within Amazon Web Services, within the cloud computing division. And um, reports from journalists who are not myself have made it seem like they've gone sort of back and forth um, trying to figure out how to um, like blend all of those teams together. And, you know, there is a report um, by Jason Del Rey uh, earlier this month about, you know, some of Amazon's core cultural tenants and how they've been challenged in the last year. And one of those tenants is that, right, no team should be larger than it would take to feed with two pizzas. <laughs> um, but that can also mean that you kind of have a fractured um, uh, workplace a little bit. And I think when you are, are needing to make these like really fast shifts to to catch up with your competitors, which isn't a position that Amazon has often found itself in. It seems like 
maybe one possibility is that it's been a little tricky to figure out um, how to how to get the people on Alexa and the devices division who are doing stuff around machine learning um, and conversational technology to sort of meld with the people who are doing some of the AI work um, within the cloud computing division because you know there's it's I think people um, especially people who uh, our consumers read consumer technology news and report consumer technology news find it very easy to look at Alexa and say, oh, Amazon totally missed the boat. But they have a they have a second, much larger AI business, right, mm -hmm. um, inside of the cloud computing division. That's maybe not as um, easy to talk about, um, but uh, it is, you know, a whole other world of expertise that they can build off of. So I think a lot of people would say, you know, there was the AI boom, and now people are asking if that um, bubble is going to burst and how are people going to make money off of this? There's definitely what the, um, what the PR geniuses at Amazon would tell you is that this is the very, 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 very beginning of a much longer story about AI. So I think we'll definitely see what happens. Um, but for sure, people have been waiting for this for a long time. Um, and I think we'll be eager to find its faults <laughs> and press on its soft spots <laughs> when it finally does launch. Um, also, in response to your earlier question on the pricing, I also meant to say um, the Wall Street Journal had previously reported that the um, devices division at and, you know, that people who actually build the um, the echoes and et cetera, uh, have lost a ton of money um, because the devices are relatively cheap and that was done on purpose to get them into everyone's home, right? It's very Amazon, low price point, get everyone addicted and then gradually ratchet up the cost with different um, subscriptions and additional features. Um, and I think uh, my colleague Shira um, at the Washington Post had a great story that followed mine this week about uh, how companies like Amazon are turning to subscriptions like this um, to try to recover or recoup some of the losses that they've seen over the years, um, which, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a story about, I guess, growing up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Um, one of the features that you mention in the piece is one that stood out to me and I think to others. Uh, it's a smart briefing feature. Mm -hmm. Talk briefly about it. Uh, letting people consume news and give them the ability to kind of uh, get summaries of the stuff that's going on. Uh, how... <sighs> I, I don't know how to put this. Um, some companies, I think, would avoid uh, having anything to do with the news, given that October as the rumored date for the launch of the new AliExA is right before the election. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Apple, for example, is a company that doesn't like to touch any of that kind of stuff with a 10 foot pole in the hopes of avoiding any kind of issues there. So <laughs> it, I, what are your thoughts, I guess? Like, is, <laughs> is, do you think that, um, it's going to be something that people are, using regularly? Do you think that this is a dangerous place for Amazon to kind of uh, step into? Or given that it's taken so long for the company to release its version, maybe, just maybe, it's been working on this for a while and is really trying to narrow in on something that uh, avoids any issues. You know, th that's one of the elements of this story that I really um, wish that someone at Amazon would have answered my questions about because I would love to know the thinking on the timing there. Um, you know, the Washington Post has reported a, a few times in the last year about issues um, specifically with answering questions about elections and getting the answers right, um, but also about other leading voice assistants and chatbots um, deciding not to answer questions about elections because it's so easy to make a mistake and the cost can be so high and frankly the press so bad that you know why why take the the risk and they've just decided to not have the chatbots um, engage um, in specific questions about global elections and and we've sort of seen that from the beginning to a certain extent right like by by limiting the time frame of certain news-based questions um, companies have tried to avoid some of the natural pitfalls um, while while keeping people engaged with their products. Um, so I wish that I knew why Amazon um, seemed to be proceeding with this um, so close to the election. Maybe in practice, you know, it might launch, but then people have to sign up for it and people have to pay for it. Maybe they're not envisioning, um, you know, a huge, massive number of people using it in those few days leading up to the election. Um, uh, um I do 
uh, understand why um, a news product is compelling in this case. Um, the news is something that happens every day. And I think it is a good driver of people um, returning to a technology on a daily mm. basis. And that's kind of what the documents that I was looking at, you know, said is that this is um, a way news and daily news updates is a way to get people returning to a technology all the time, right? Um, and if you can build a news product that people um, want to listen to every single morning, well, that gets them, you know, back into the world of the device and using it every day. And in, in an instance where you're now charging people um, to use the service, right, that, e that makes even more sense. Um, how it will actually all play out, whether, you know, whether some people are going to be hearing uh, smart briefings by AI, ALEXA on the morning of uh, the when the election results are announced. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't know if that's actually how it will play out. Um, but it is something that I had questions about just because um, of the struggles that we've seen in the past and the decisions made by other companies. And obviously, um, you know, throughout the last two years, we've seen people, like I said before, testing and pushing the buttons on and looking for the weak points on um, all manner of different generative AI technologies. And um, you know, it's not that hard to find them, right? They the they can hallucinate and they make mistakes, et cetera. So um, it's something that I would personally be careful with in such a crucial news moment. And I guess we'll just have to see how it plays out because Amazon didn't want to discuss it further with me. Hmm. Well, uh, it isn't a surprise to see Amazon with this uh, new way of doing things focus heavily on shopping related features. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, as you talked about, kind of the, the method there with Amazon, get it into the home and then try different ways of getting them to engage and interact and buy uh, our different products and services. Do you think that, um, you know, this aspect of of Amazon's new ALEXA is going to be any more impactful than what we have now, which is on, for example, Echo Show devices constantly popping up and showing me, this is a product that you should buy. And I'm going, well, I just bought that exact same thing. And so I don't need <laughs> another one that's just like it. I already have the one that I ordered. And all of the kind of odd things that it does to try to get you to interact, maybe it becomes more convincing when the AI is more conversational. And suddenly, you know, you ask it a question about uh, what's the weather like tomorrow. And next thing you know, you've purchased a new pair of uh, galoshes uh, that, that keep your, your feet nice and dry outside <laughs> for the rain. Um, yeah, that reminds me of that one tweet, right? That was like, um, Amazon's advertising algorithm seems to think that my recent purchase of a toaster wasn't because I needed a toaster, but because I'm embarking on the hobby of collecting toasters, <laughs> something <laughs> along those lines. That's um, perfect. That is what it seems like. It's a total ripoff of someone else's joke. It's not my joke, but um, I still think about it and still think it was funny. I mean, I first of all, if you read the comments on the story that we published, you can see uh, very clearly that users are frustrated by how many Amazon ads they are encountering in their lives. Amazon ads are now playing more frequently on Prime Video, and they seem to be popping up on ALEXA all the time, and people seem quite frustrated by it. So that's, you know, an existential matter for um, the company to consider. I will say some of the shopping features that I saw described in these documents, like, seemed pretty compelling. Um, you know, you could tell that you're in the market for head headphones that are not um, so broken. Um, <laughs> and uh, she will um, monitor prices for you starting at that point. And if there's like a sudden drop in, a, in the price point of an item that you're looking for, she'll alert you and tell you to go buy them at that time, right? That's that seems like cool. a totally smart, consumer-friendly, um, interesting um, feature. And one that, according to the documents, you know, they're pretty excited about and think that people will love. Um, so it's not just, you know, trying to make you buy things that you don't need. And a lot of it seemed to be around, um, I don't know, using your ring camera to show if your packages are on your porch yet. Did it come yet? Okay, it came and I want to return it. And you're talking to saying, oh, does it come in any other colors? You know, stuff like that. It's not just um, advertising new products to you, but it does. Um, it does seem like people don't want to be advertised to so much, or at least they would like to be advertised to better. Um, yeah. And I think we'll just have to wait and see if the new um, conversational, charismatic, likable is going to deliver that experience.
The last thing I'll ask you is uh, Amazon for a long time um, kind of received the brunt of the negative uh, press and attention for privacy concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether, you know, it was deserved or not, that did happen. And the company over time in response to, uh, you know, that regular that regular criticism started to in every product launch and every introduction of a new thing, make privacy one of the tenants and uh, an important aspect of what it was talking about and explain how uh, it planned on protecting your privacy and showing you where you could go to make updates to your privacy settings, et cetera, et cetera. In the documentation or in any research that you did about this, was there any, was it was anything made clear about what Amazon is doing, plans on doing, um, plans on talking about in terms of a just actual privacy, but also b talking to the potential consumers about what uh, you know how privacy comes into play with this new generative AI system? Yeah. Um, first, I would say that the documents um, are not marketing documents. So in terms of talking about messaging or talking about how we talk about things, um, that's not something I saw or or know about. Um, I, I would say that, though, um, in the list of features that I did see in these documents, um, yeah, I mean, some of them were about privacy. Uh, and some of them were about security and safety and how to port those things over from classic Alexa to the new experience. And the place where I noticed that coming up the most is probably in the kids um, products there. I, th- I think people generally know that kids kind of like Alexa, maybe even more than adults do. They kind of enjoy making her do stuff and asking her silly questions. And um, so there's a, a section that talks about the features that we'll be launching for kids, um, which is sort of something I would like to dig into more, frankly. I don't think we know enough about what it means for um, children to be interacting with an artificial intelligence and do they understand what it is? And, you know, are we, um, I'm not accusing Amazon at all of like, you know, handing over uh, our children's education to this device, but I'm just like curious. I don't know that much about it. Um, uh, And I, I'm intrigued to know that that is a major function of what they think might uh, appeal to customers as sort of an educational entertainment device for kids. But in the section that described that um, and described the various like questions kids could ask and how you wanted to have them answered, et cetera, there was a pretty a pretty chunky section about privacy and how you would um, ensure that the person you were talking to was a kid and how you would treat them and how you would keep their information separate from the rest of and create a separate experience. So hmm. I saw it reflected there. Um, you know, I don't know what that will mean necessarily in the long run, but um, it was definitely present. That's good to hear. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to uh, give us an understanding of the potential launch of this new version of Amazon's virtual assistant, uh, potentially in October. Uh, we will definitely be keeping our eye out for that true launch. And uh, of course, folks can head over to WashingtonPost.com to check out the work that you do. Is there anywhere else they should go to follow along and keep up with what you are uh, putting out there? Uh, smoke signals only for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, so <laughs> WashingtonPost.com. Uh, Caroline, I want to thank you so much again for being here. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon.